guys. Um, welcome back. So great to have you. Please, um, I want to be sure that you can hear me and see me. And more importantly, you can as hear and see Grant. Hey, Grant, how you doing, man? Good to you, Thank you. Uh, perfect. While you answer, so, and I want to be sure that we are picking you up on the chat because throughout this, we want to get your question. So uh, why don't you hit us up on the chat, say hello, tell us where you're connecting from, as well as what shoes you are wearing. And you know our rule, ladies, if you're wearing high heels, we want to see the proof. <laughs> Hi, Oba Gang. So good to have you here. Hi, Charlie. Hey, everyone. So just um, making sure you can hear myself and Grant. Um, good stuff. Yamkela, uh, shoes, shoes, shoes. What shoes are you wearing? And again, very important. I want to be sure that you can hear Grant. Grant, what's the weather like in Cape Town? Oh, it's actually pretty good today, actually. So I'm really, uh, really enjoying it. The kids are out oh. and about in the box, nice and quiet oh, in here. That's awesome. These are the last few days here. Hello, Charlie. Good to see you. Um, hey, Mashuru Pulukwan in the house. Perfect. Uh, uh, wearing mm, asas. Okay, perfect, everyone. So once again, welcome um, from Epic Woman. So great to have you here with us today. Um, we've got some people that are wearing sneakers, no shoes, and others are remaining anonymous for their own safety, I can tell. Hmm? Um, once again, Epic Woman is a part of the Epic Network where entrepreneurs and property investors come together to really just empower ourselves and equip ourselves to just start realizing our dreams. Epic Woman in particular focuses on key elements that affect and address us as women. Now you might ask, who's an Epic Woman? An Epic Woman is a now woman. This is a woman that realizes, you know what, I've got something to give to the world. And more importantly, I'm ready to scale my dreams now. I'm not going to be limited by being playing one role, whether it's I'm just in corporate. I'm going to be in corporate and have my side hustle, or I'm just a mother. I'm going to be a mother and run my business. You know, I'm just a wife. I'm going to be a wife and just a badass boss because we can. And so we've come together to share resources, to upskill one another, to empower and inspire one another to get it done. So all the Epic Women in the house, a big, big welcome to you. Um, secondly, if you haven't yet joined our Facebook page for whatever reason, don't waste any time. I've posted the link. Go and like um, <laughs> Epic Woman uh, right there. Um, we do have a, a, a random epic man clearly in the crowd there, Charlie. <laughs> so uh, good to have you here too. They, they tend to sneak in once in a while. So Grant is invited. And then we have the guys that keep sending me messages, Grant always, that says, can I attend this webinar? And I always say, as long as you're silent, you can come, right? Um, so Megs, hey, good to have you here. So make sure that you join our Epic Woman Facebook page. If you already part of our Facebook group, you've probably seen it. We are moving to our own Facebook page. So you must also click on that link and join. Before we get to the business of today, I have an, an exciting announcement. So a couple of weeks ago, we ran a competition, which was our like and share Epic um, Women Facebook group uh, competition. So we encouraged everyone to like our page, share it with their friends and get everyone on. And we had an awesome, awesome prize. Um, it was an audible book that our winner was going to get. And it's very, I'm very, very excited because it is, the book is the whole Netflix story. The name of the book is called That Will Never Work. Now, if you are here wanting to start your side hustle, wanting to start your own business, and you keep hearing this voice that that will never work, you should have liked and shared, right? So a big announcement, our winner of our Facebook uh, page, like and share, is Candace London. Woo! Woo! Nice to be Candace. 
Well done, Candice. Thank you so much for, for, for participating. And Candice is an epic woman, always with us, always participating. So we're very excited. Um, we're going to just share all that with you, Candice, and get in touch with you so you can start listening. Now, to everybody else, when we put out a competition, you better get on top of it. Um, so watch out because there's going to be one coming very soon. Now, I know you're not here to listen to me. So I'm going to get to the business of the day. I am very excited for you. Hey, um, I'm very excited for you guys today because we uh, invited our own epic woman man. <laughs> we have Grant Smear in the house today. Now, you might not know this, but Grant is the co-founder of Epic Woman. Oh, yes. <laughs> right. And, um, and uh, you know, Grant is in my, don't tell him, okay, he's not listening. Uh, but he's very high in the list of people that I think are beyond badass <laughs> that I'm going to keep, that I already have on speed, speed dial, that he knows, and that are so exceptional that I fully respect and honor. Um, he is a serial entrepreneur um, that has proven the system for himself. But more importantly for me, he has this overwhelming commitment to empowering people and taking people along. It's not just lip service. It's about making it happen. And he like carries it. Half the time I'm like, Grant, why are we taking these people along with us? Let's just leave them behind and run. Um, but it's right Cordy's heart. And not only that, you are in for it because he's a straight talker. Uh, kick your butt into action and make it happen. And what I love is it's not just words because he's done it and proven it. So I strongly encourage you. Here I am with my book. And my piece of paper, get ready to be inspired. And more than anything, um, get ready to get into action. So um, he's here. He'll watch the chat. I'll watch the chat. Um, you can ask questions all the way. Grant, it is such an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you, my friend. Yeah, with everybody. And I and the epic man in there. Thank you. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Everyone can hear me okay. I'm just checking quickly. Can you hear fine? Perfect. Cool. Well, yeah, no, thank you, Rob, and thanks uh, everybody for joining us today. I'm quite excited about um, having this conversation. It's a little bit different to all the chats I've been having in the last few weeks. Um, my other business is a property business um, where we, we focus on property services and, and property investment. So this is really much more core to my heart, which is entrepreneurship and really moving people forward. And I don't believe that there's any time better than now that we start empowering and enabling and moving entrepreneurs forward, those that have got potential, those that are wanting to move forward. Um, because South Africa and our economy and um, the world economy needs really people that are going to start uh, creating things rather than um, you know, leeching or taking away from things. So we really need to be in a space where we are building um, building and growing and by building and growing ourselves and our communities and our families, we go building and growing um, our country. So, so, you know, it's one of those things that I, I really truly believe that we need to be in a space where we're taking entrepreneurs forward more than anything and more than ever before empowering. And that's regardless of whether they're man, woman, child, you know, I mean, um, you know, and I'll talk a little bit later on about um, even teaching our children now about entrepreneurship and moving them forward and making sure that they have something sustainable and that they can grow into themselves later on. So I just want to start off by saying, you know, it's not my intention to be motivational at all. It's not my intention to be um, inspirational because true entrepreneurs don't, neither need motivation or entrepreneurship. Um, from me or anybody else, you know, really, you should be a self-starter. You should be ready to go. You should have your idea that really inspires you and um, drives you every morning and wakes you up and gets you out of bed and, and gets you going. You know, um, it's, uh, you know, I'm happy to give you a push um, and I'm happy to tell you, you know, it'll be okay and give you a pat on the head. Um, but the reality is that, that you've, got to, you've got to do it. And you, you really, as an entrepreneur sitting here today, listen to calls like this and, and empowering yourself and moving yourself forward. You've got this, you know, the only thing you need to do is stop thinking about it. 
you know, the stars are never going to align. The planets aren't going to align for you. You know, things aren't going to just fall into place for you. Then you're going to have to actually get it done. And there's never a good time to start a business outside of now. So when you're ready. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen and, and um, start actually then getting to the presentation. But, you know, again, it's, it's not about being motivational. It's, it's about just getting you to take that first step. And it's, it's the first step you need to take. The rest is easy. So just... Uh, sorry. Cool. So I really want you to stop thinking. Um, and you know, that's the subject of today's thing is stop thinking and start executing. But let's do this and let's stop overthinking. Yeah. Stop overthinking everything. You know, it's never going to be perfect. Your idea is never going to be exactly right. Yeah. You know? And you might have the perfect idea, have gone through a thousand iterations and take it to market and you realize, you know, what, you've misread it. Or not only have you misread it, but you've missed the gap. And how often have we seen businesses that have, have not only missed the gap, but they've launched and the idea is so brilliant and so far ahead of their time that they actually go out of business because the, the, the market isn't ready for it. So stop overthinking what you're trying to do and just take a step and move forward. Just take that first step. Because the, the reason we often overthink it, oh, sorry, that's it. the reason we often overthink it is because we're so fearful, we're so scared of something. And this is, I'm stealing this quote from uh, Nick Carolumbus who wrote um, How to Start a Side Hustle. And he's, he, he says in one of the interviews I watched, he says, unless you're going to die, there is nothing to fear. Failure isn't something to fear because failure isn't real. Failure is only something we've made up for ourselves. Think about school, you know, we, and, and I mean, how many of you can put up your hand that have failed a subject in school, university? Has it made a fundamental difference to your entire life if you look back now? No, no, it freaking hasn't. That 38% or 36% or 2% who, who cares you got in history doesn't actually matter in the great scheme of things. In that moment, we feel like we're failures and we're told by society, our parents, our teachers, that we've failed. But the reality is you haven't died. It hasn't killed you. And the worst thing to happen out of it is that you've learned something. So, so I really want to encourage you to two things. Stop overthinking your subject. Stop overthinking the, the business deal. And stop being fearful of taking that step. Because those are the two things that are stopping you. It's you stopping yourself and nobody else. One thing I come across quite often is, is how um, everybody uh, talks about getting, doing a business plan. Now, detailed business plans are great. Great for investors. But the reality is, is you're just guessing. You know, you, you, if you're sitting down today and you haven't sold the product, you haven't sold your service, you haven't got a client yet, you're just really guessing what the market wants, what the market, how the market's going to react, how your marketing's going to work, how your brand is going to work, how your route to market's going to work. All these things, you're making massive assumptions and you're really just wasting your time because people spend months and months and months, if not years, on making the detailed business plans. They miss the opportunity and they never get going. And to be honest, all it ends up being, a detailed business plan is a crutch and the crutch is for you not to get started. It's a thing you're saying, you know, I'm just going to finish my business plan and then I'm going to do it. I'm just going to finish my business plan. I'm going to do it. And you say that now, you say it's six months time and a year's time. And you never get to a place where that detailed business plan is ever right because the, move, the, the market and, and consumers are moving so fast these days that you just can never keep up. And the reality, it's a crutch for you to stick in your job and stay where you're really not happy, but you've got this detailed business plan that, that's the barrier to entry for you. You're just guessing at the end of the day. And what I want to talk about a little bit is just going for a one-page business plan, which is so much more important. One-page business plan, and I'll, I'll get into the specifics of it, but what it is, it gives you no excuse. It's a single page, single A4 page. It's going to draw a table on, and you, oh, that didn't come up at all. Sorry, that's uh, the virtual screen. So it's a single page that you're, you're going to draw right down, and you're going to write down a few elements that are going to really give you a picture of what your business is going to look like. And it's not supposed to be perfect. It's not supposed to give you every single detail and every single answer. What it just needs to give you is allow you to think about your business, think about how you're going to get your product to market, think about who your consumer is, and really your price point and your costs. If you can do that and you can get out there and actually just do it rather than talk about it or write it down, you're going to be in a much better position. And those of you who, who have heard me speak before um, know that I'm a huge fan of um, Gary Vaynerchuk. And Gary Vaynerchuk... Um, talks about something is, is that execution is a million times more important than perfection or speed is a million times more important than, ex, uh, than, than perfection. And it's so important to understand. And, and I, I know that I've myself been caught up in it. There. You just want the perfect product, the perfect, the perfect um, you know, service, the perfect um, product mix, everything else. 
and you work so hard on trying to create and recreate and, and reiterate and, and everything else around this product that you never get to a space where you actually get it to market and then you sometimes miss the boat. So, so get it to market, get your first idea to market and we'll talk about minimum viable, viable product later is get it to market as soon as possible and that's where you start executing. And the real learning starts then. The real start of learning starts when you go to open market and you've got your product or your service out and you start getting feedback from your clients as much as possible. Just before I go into the business plan, just remember that if you want to ask a question, ask it in the Q&A um, and uh, Q&A box. And if you just want to chat, there's obviously the chat box as well. So just throw any chats in there. Um, but I'll keep an eye on it. I know Corral will also keep an eye on the, on the chat box for me as we go. Um, so also, if I'm speaking too fast, I apologize. You're just going to have to keep up. Um, so that's my, my short answer to that for you guys. Um, so cool. So Tabang's asking there already, um, I get the one page business plan, but how should one spend time validating the business idea and take it to the market or rather work on minimum viable products? And I will get to that Tabang. Um, hopefully I'll sort of answer your question as I go through um, next, next few sections here on the one page business plan. Um, if I don't, I'll come back to it. So if you're going to look at your one page business plan, um, and I know often uh, we have these ideas, we sit down and we say, you know what, you know, a, um, I don't know, um, a rubberized mat would be great for a wooden table so that I don't uh, burn it every time I put my cigarette down, you know, I think that's a great problem to have. And we go and create this rubberized mat and we have it all fancy and we, we package it nicely and we come up with a beautiful brand and we take it to market. And what we realize is that the product we've come up for, there's no market for it. And then we go door to door, we knock on doors and we try and sell this product. We've got, you know, we've bought a thousand units or 10,000 units from China and we're trying to sell these units and we're trying to push it to every market. And we, we've, we work, we, we're trying to force a product down a consumer's, consumer's mouth or, or, or down the, the, the customer's um, throat. The reality is, is we're going about the wrong way. You need to start with the community of the segment first. Community is the group of a group of people who have got a common interest. So a common interest community, people who are interested in the same thing. So let's take this group of example that we've got, um, you know, all the attendees are interested in entrepreneurship and starting a business, or you've got people who attend property seminars who are interested in investing property, or you've got people who will follow an Instagram, um, Instagram uh, group or Instagram profile about, you know, um, I don't know, to focus where's their attention once you identify the community you start then digging into potentially a segment of the community so let's again take entrepreneurship you go okay well within entrepreneurship you've got your startup and you've got your guys who are more established so they, there's two segments there or you've got your guys who are failing in business or you've got your guys that are looking to grow through purchase of um distressed businesses those are segments within the same community once we look at the, and identify the segment, we can then identify the problem that that segment or community is having, and we create a solution. Now, this often comes up, and if you watch a lot of TV shows around entrepreneurship and you read a lot of books, they often start with solve a problem. And we're like, geez, solve a problem. You know, it sounds so big and, and massive. And, and the reality is, it's actually so key and fundamental to everything is you're solving a problem. It's not solving, you know, uh, it'd be nice to be solving world hunger or or solving you know, poverty or anything else. Really, you're solving a, a very key and small problem for somebody that continues being an issue for them. And by solving that problem, you're adding value to their lives. So you're saving time, you're making something accessible, far more accessible. And let's just use Uber, for example. Uber didn't invent taxis. What they did was that they made taxis much more accessible to, to people and also created value to people by bringing, for bringing their vehicles on, on board and then they could create a business for themselves. So it created a value chain and value chain that was value on a, a, a double-edged value chain. And it's important that when you're looking for a problem, you're looking for something where you're gonna add value to people. Because that means uh, you're saving time, you uh, create a convenience for them, or, or potentially um, like the gig economy has, has created, creates creating income for people. So it's so important that you, you, you consider community and segment first, and then you look at, at problem. Are you going to say to me what community, what segment? Well, what segment or community are you part of at the moment? What what group of people do you share common interest with? You might have a hobby that you do. You might have, you know, there's a million things that could create a community. It's just where there's a common interest. Um, and and they're using example. There was there's a, um, a magazine in um, in Australia, which is like our entrepreneur magazine, but it's called Founder. 
and there was a lady featured on there who created a, um, a six-figure Aussie dollar um, business. So talking in hundreds of thousands of, of dollar business a month um, off the back of an Instagram group she created on um, flavored water. And she created this group and started posting all the recipes within, I think, eight or nine months. She had 800,000 followers. She watched that group and then identified a product that, that she could go back and sell to that group. So she didn't create a product and take it to the general market and then go and find the, the people that, that were interested in that. She knew that this group of people were interested in something and she created a product and went straight into it. Um, is everyone in the uh, query struggling with my sound? Is anybody else struggling with my sound at all? So let me know. Maybe I'm just uh, speaking too fast. Grow is my sound okay there? Um, I, I can hear you quite clearly, Grant. I just have moments where you slip away, but they, they're a bit okay. random. Okay. Okay. So okay. It looks Sounds like good. it's more than... More just a connection. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Occasional, yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's, this will, let's, let's, if it gets too much, uh, if it starts impairing us completely, I'll let you know. Okay, I'll also t kill my video if I need to. Um, okay. Cool. So, so what, what she did is she, she created a community for herself to then take the product and remarket it to them. And I think it's such an important lesson and something, something that I really encourage you guys to do is identify a community or segment and the problem within that segment and then take the product to the market versus going to the general public. The big issue with taking a product that you've created to the general public is it's so expensive to try and get your product to market. Um, advertising costs are enormous. If you can take a, um, you know, a product to an, a community that you know are interested and know might buy a product, you, you're on a much better with it. So it's okay. cool. And then you take them the solution. So you identify the community, you identify the problem and your product or your service is then the solution that you're offering them. Okay, so this is now um, identifying your customer. Um, that, that portion is identifying your customer. The next part is your uh, unique value proposition. So your UVP, um, I think it's often used in sales or your new unique selling point. And your unique value proposition is, is what is the value that you're bringing to this? Now, um, you know, good service isn't a, a unique value proposition, you know, but similarly in this um, disruption phase that we're going through, we're going through a lot of, um, and you say, what is your, what's the disruption? We're cheaper. You know, being cheaper is not disruptive. Being cheaper is being cheaper. Um, you've got to come to market where you actually fundamentally change the business model and how people that way, how your consumer interacts with the supplier or the provider or interacts, or you're creating a whole new economy. Now, um, Airbnb obviously has disrupted the hotel market because they've created a whole new economy of people of bringing short-term accommodation to the market where there was no other option similar to um, um, Uber being a short term. But a, a other disruptors, people who have come in and said they're disruptors, they're bringing tech and then they're bringing, they bring costs down, aren't disruptors at all. They're in fact just um, making product cheaper with a slightly more efficient business system. So you need to look at your unique value proposition and define what that is. What is the value you bring into your account because that's what they're gonna pay for. They're not gonna just pay for something that they get elsewhere or if, they, if you're not bringing something that's um, of value to you, you need to make sure that you're doing huge amount of, of volume. Now, the example is if you were going to bring uh, bottled water to the market right now, you're not going to be able to charge 50 or 100 rand for bottled water because there's so many bottle, uh, bottled water um, options out there. So you'd have to get to a space where you're selling hundreds of thousands, if not millions of bottles of water to actually make real money. And this is exactly the same. Your unique value proposition might be that you, you deliver uh, the water um, you know, packaged in, in uh, a box with a ribbon, for example. I don't know. Um, to somebody at a specific room temperature, as an example. So you identify your unique value proposition in terms of your solution. And this is the one that I really like a lot, is what is your unfair advantage? Now, you're, uh, I sort of have given it to you already, but the, define what your unfair advantage is by taking it to market. Let's take an example of um, bottled water. And you know, if you're going to be uh, soft bottling water, what is your unfair advantage in terms of that? If you're sitting in a metro, there's no unfair advantage because it's very, very difficult to, to have an unfair advantage from that perspective. You've got a lot of retailers of bottled water. But if you're sitting in, in a remote town and it's very difficult for any bottled suppliers to get um, supply to you, and you happen to have the only fresh spring water on your farm, as an example, and you can bottle that water, that's your unfair advantage. 
that you have access to supply that nobody else might have. And this is vitally important that you identify this unfair advantage because this is really the edge that you're always going to be looking for. And I'll speak about um, keeping an eye out for the edge, um, always, no matter what business you're in. So identify your unique value proposition as well as your unfair advantage when you're going to market. And the last thing is channels. How are you getting your product to market, but not only how you're getting it to market from a distribution point of view, but how are you getting your clients, your community or segment to know about you? Now, I already mentioned the lady who has a um, Instagram account where she's created a following and she's gone straight to those guys and that's where she sold. And that's in fact where she could her Instagram account. So, so identify your channels of how you're going to get this solution, which is, has a unique value proposition, and you've got an unfair advantage, you're going to take it to, to your market as much as possible. So identify your channels. And then two things here, which is often, often overlooked when you get into entrepreneurship, but you've got this grand idea, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take over the world, and you've got this grand idea, and it, yes, it's going to cost 100,000 rand to come together with this thing, it's going to cost 2 million rand to put an app together. And then you look at the, so you know the costings, but then you look at the revenue, and the revenue comes, you're only going to make 10 rand per subscriber, so suddenly to justify 2 million rand investment on an app, for example, when you're 10 rand a subscriber, it's going to cost, or I'm going to need thousands and thousands and thousands of customers or consumers that are going to make use of this and actively pay me to make any sort of return. And this is the real techno uh, technology issue at the moment is, is technology costs so much money to implement if you aren't, don't have that skill set yourself to then generate the revenue, you have to have a really good value proposition. Right in the beginning um, of apps and the creation of apps, there was a really good opportunity for you to do this. The costs were always succeeded by the revenue you could create. But now there's so many options in terms of apps as an example that it very, becomes very, very difficult to, to generate revenue off the back of simply an app idea. Your underlying service, which is powered by the app, is something that you need to um, go from. So just keep that in mind. Cool. So that's your one-page business plan. So, so it's really something you want to have on the one side, on your left-hand side, your community segment, um, your problem and solution. In the middle, you're going to have your unique value proposition, your unfair advantage and channels. On the right-hand side, you're going to have your costs and your revenue. What you need to remember is that you also need to be able to have, let me see if this works. So yeah, you need to make sure that the revenue that you're going to try and generate, the community is willing to pay for it. So if you're going to focus, for example, on the student market or the um, you know, scholar market, high school students, for example, and you're going to create this use the app, as an example, you're going to have an app, but it costs 100 rand per person per month for that. You're very unlikely, it's very unlikely that students or scholars are going to pay 100 rand per month because they don't have that sort of money. So although you've got, you've got a community, you've got a problem and solution, you've created a unique value, value proposition, you've got an unfair advantage, you can get it to them, you understand the cost of creating that product, but the revenue, the customer that you have is not going to be able to pay that revenue or pay, you that, that pay the, the amount for that product, you actually don't have a business. But also keep in mind what resources are you going to need for, for this, um, for this uh, business. You know, if you're going to get into manufacturing space, are you going to have to have a factory? You know, can you, can you um, afford all the, the costs of buying all the manufacturing equipment that you need? Or can you go and identify a supplier that can make manufacture for you initially as you start to roll out your business? So you need to really know what your, um, what your, your resources are that you're going to need to now create your product. If you're going to come up with a physical product, you need manufacture, you need um, importing, you know, you need import license, you might need um, funding to get the, those imports items out here. You might have to pay in advance for those items to come in or you might have to take bank guarantee. There's so many things and items you need to identify in terms of resources. You know, do you need a phone line? Do you need, um, you know, internet service provider? Do you need um, email addresses? Everything, all the, all the resources that you might need to actually execute this business and you need to list those down. I've got here a quick question. Um, so what is the process of identifying your community segment? I think really where you, where you need to play initially is in a space that you understand, best understand. And I've got, a, uh, I'll talk about mentors a bit later, but um, uh, my, my um, most current business mentor is actually my aunt, um, who's an ultra successful um, woman in the um, clothing industry, in the fashion industry. Um, has a enormous business um, as one of the major suppliers to True It. Um, and um, she, you know, I, I always speak to her about business. I said to her one day, um, you know, 
I want to get out of property. Yeah. And she said to me, stick with what you know. I was like, you know, I really, I really want to diversify and try and look at other things. And she said, stick with what you know. And I got out and I started looking at a couple of options, got involved in a business that I hated, absolutely hated. In fact, it was manufacturing. And um, very quickly, six months, well, very quickly, six months later, went straight back into property. And that was now, uh, you know, nine years ago. So, so stick with what you know. So when you are trying to identify a community, look at the community that you're involved in now, look at your immediate interests. And the really cool thing about uh, where we are now is that you can make money doing anything these days. If you're interested in, I don't know, for example, ballet, or you're interested in, in model airplanes, or you, I mean, you know, these, there are people making money. Um, I mean, in fact, there's kids making money just posting photos on Instagram these days, unfortunately. But, but beyond that, there's really, you can make money doing anything. You just need to, again, identify the community of segments and, and is there a problem within that segment? Um, so, and, and I'll sort of give you a hint later on um, towards the end of one of the, one of the phrases you want to listen out for, which shows you that where there might be a big opportunity within a segment. Hope that answers your question here. Uh, I think it was Charlie. Cool. So once you've got your one page business plan, I think this is important. We were saying uh, stop thinking, start executing. You need to get started executing, you know, and Nick Harolumbus, who um, from uh, Nick Harry Socks, he had a plan when he started Nick Harry Socks. He started, he took 5,000 Rand. He said he's going to take, um, I think it was six weeks to formulate the business and get started and execute. And then one month to prove the business plan, prove the concept. And so it was a 10 week plan, 10 weeks to start a business that he, uh, a few years later he sold for a lot of money. I think he had four four branches that he sold for a lot of money to some of the biggest uh, sock shops in uh, or shop sh sock chains in in the country. So it's important that you execute more than anything else rather than plan. So um, if you, in terms of executing, and Tabang, I hope this helps you with with now sort of looking at it, is you need to look at a proof of concept. And proof of concept says, okay, if I'm going to sell socks as an example, I'm going to order ten pairs of socks colorful stocks with X, Y design. And I'm going to try and uh, firstly see how the process works when we get the items in from, from China, we'll get them manufactured locally, check the costing, and then I'm going to take those, those stocks and I'm going to take them to a, uh, and find customers. So I might set up a table in a, in a market store, for example, or throw an ad online on Facebook, on Instagram, and make sure that there is something, uh, something from, from that perspective, somebody buys it. And um, uh, those of you who know Marnus Broderick from Nine Rules for Entrepreneurs, he says something brilliant, which is you only have a business once you have a sale in an on transaction. So somebody you don't know, not your family, not your friends, not a close relation, not somebody that, you, you're, that uh, is employed by you. Somebody else buys your product because they see value in it and they pay you what you expect for it. So let's use a socks example. I create socks. I get 80 rand socks. I land them here and I want to sell them at 150 rand. Only once somebody has bought those at 150 rand, do I know I have a business? And that is where the proof of concept comes. I've got an idea in my head and I've proven it because I've created the product and I've sold it. I've gone through the entire process, the entire chain. Until you have that, you have literally nothing. You don't have a business, you literally have only an idea. And ideas um, on their own are absolutely useless. But in terms of what I was saying earlier, uh, Gary Vee, you know, um, execution is way more important than perfection. And you need to create a minimum viable product. So, you know, your idea might be to have, and let's use Nick Harry, the, uh, a chain of stores around the country, and you want to have the most beautiful shop in the world. You've got to start somewhere. And there's nothing wrong with starting as a minimum viable product with a table in a market store with a whole lot of pairs of socks and selling those socks and then moving up from there. So. The minimum viable product is something, the fastest way that you can create what you, uh, the base of what you're trying to do without all the add-on products, without all the cross-selling, the main, the main core product, and let's call this a minimum viable product, let's create the hero. And once you've created the hero, the hero sells, and then we build from there. So proof of concept, go through the process, don't spend a fortune, go through a learning phase. You might find that when you, when you order those socks that nobody wants them. You know, everybody wants those socks with toes on, for example, or, or whatever whatever it is. So go through proof of concept, create an involved product and take it to market. Um, so, you know, and, and that's how you validate a business idea. You can't validate a business idea by uh, asking questions, asking people answers, um, you know, um, surveys. And that, that's not a, 
that, that's not a way to validate a business idea. The only way to visit, validate a business idea is start doing. Now you can start doing, if you're full-time employed, you can start doing in the evenings, during lunchtime, in the mornings, on weekends. Take a look at where you're spending your time at the moment. You know, often, often, and at the moment, a lot of people aren't commuting. But by not commuting, you've added basically two, two and a half hours to your day. What are you doing for those two, two and a half hours? Are you sitting having coffee longer, or are you trying to execute your business idea? What are you doing on the weekends? And I'm going to talk about sacrifice a little bit later. But, but what are you doing to make sure that you're moving forward in terms of your business um, in the time that you have? Now we have minimum commitments. We sometimes have to give, maintain our jobs because we've got a um, uh, we, we've got, uh, uh, you know, we've got income requirements and we've got expenses, we've got a budget we need to maintain. Might be a single parent family, um, you know, might be on your own single person. You might have a family that you need to you know, supplement income. You know, might not have any options. It's vitally important that you keep your job and don't leave. And one of the biggest mistakes I made early on was I left my job way too early um, in terms of chasing this, um, this dream, this, this concept. And look, it, it, it didn't um, stop the process and I didn't crash and burn, but it certainly did hamper uh, my progress and I would have been a lot further along had I just stuck around for 18 months or two years in the job and done something on the sideline. So Charlie's asking, how do you create a proof concept with a service? So Charlie, I think, I think the, the easiest thing here is, is if you're going to create a service of any sort, um, you know, and, and remember service, service generally you're selling generally selling two things um, when you're selling um, when you are when you're selling a service you're selling either your um, your time or your expertise those are the two things you're selling so what I would do is if you have an expertise of some sort I'll put an ad out there and use um, a Saturday Sunday evenings to execute on that on the service if it is um, a service where you literally physically selling your time again I would look at doing Saturday mornings or you know plan plan six weeks ahead and take a week off from work and go and execute on it and go and see whether you get customers. So again, the proof of concept really is around, is around um, uh, proving that there's a market for what you're offering and that that market is willing to pay what you need to justify you doing it. How long should you uh, take to leave your job? The minute that your hourly rate in your, in your job is less than the hourly rate you get for executing your business. Uh, is when you should leave it and you are able to then um, uh, migrate across. So let's say your minimum requirements, your minimum budget requirements, 10,000 rand an hour, or sorry, 10,000 rand a month. And at 10,000 rand a month, um, you are, are comfortable and your business exceeds that. And you can see that there's growth because when you're in your business, you can then earn 12,000 rand a month in your business. You, you leave it, your job, you lose 10,000, replace 12,000, and then carry on growing and building from there. Now, don't do a like-to-like -like comparison because obviously, remember, when you have um, a business, you're taking all the risks. You're taking financial risk. You're taking business risk. You're taking uh, market risk. There's so many things. I mean, people who left their, their, their jobs earlier this year to go and execute and create a business um, and then hit on, on March 26th with a lockdown um, got absolutely annihilated. So you need to make sure that you're in a, in a position to see yourself through. When I go back uh, from the UK to South Africa and got involved in business here, I knew we had two years worth of income or two years worth of reserves to see us through. So I had two years to sit and build a business. So what I would suggest, suggest is that you create a buffer for yourselves to move away from your move away from your job, your secure income into a space where you can be looked after for a while. You don't have to rely on the business. You don't have to drain the business of any income. Because that's also one of the biggest mistakes early entrepreneurs make is they drain their business from a lifestyle perspective or, or firstly maintain their lifestyle, but secondly, um, improve their lifestyle and they drain the business and then the business and you don't have the chance to reinvest and allow the business to grow and and um, become a lot bigger to compounding cool. okay and then i just want to sort of um go through some of the rules that i've applied in the last um, 15 years of, of having my own business um some of these are more recent rules that I've sort of learned and I think I've learned through experience. Um, one of them is my own, but um, let's go through them quickly. The 80-20 Pareto's law um, is something we, you know, we always talk about the 80-20 rule. And I can't tell you how true it is, is that 80% of our revenue is generated by 20% of our customers and 80% of our problems is also generated by 20% of the customers. You must not be scared to get rid of, get rid of the 20% that creates 80% of the headaches. I know it really feels sometimes like, like you know, you're losing revenue, particularly early on, you chase 
and you chase. But the problem is you, once you, you, two things, you realize how much time those people take, but also how much stress they put on you from running your own business. You and, and you only realize once you get rid of them, how it frees you up to then chase the 20% 20, 20 more that are generate 80% of your business. So 80 to 80, 20 law is vitally important that you apply to all aspects of your business, you know, particularly in terms of, of revenue, in terms of market share, in terms of where you're growing. So the 80, 20 law is, is, a, is a really good one to keep in mind all the time. When you, when a customer's shouting at you down the phone, you know, just think, think, where do you sit? Where do you sit when, from my, from a business point of view? Hopefully you don't have a customer shouting at you. It's never a pleasant space, but you know, no one's perfect. So the 80, 20 law is vitally important for you to keep, keep in mind. Um, while you're running your business. Where do you spend 20% of your time, uh, sorry, where do you spend 80% of your time um, within your business, you know? You should be spending the 20% of your, uh, sorry, um, the 20% 20, 20 of your time on the 80% the of your revenue you should increase that amount of time. The more time you spend on those areas that are really making money, the more valuable your business comes to. This is my 60-40 law, um, and it's, I'll call it um, uh, SME law. And the SME law is, it actually comes from a long or lengthy discussions I had with my father-in-law around running a business. Uh, when we started a business in Joburg and then we decided to move to Cape Town, he didn't think it was possible because he's very hands-on. Um, he's very controlling around his businesses. He doesn't think that, that you can execute as well um, if you aren't in your business watching it every step of the way. And there's two really big issues that is, is I mean, I don't think he's ever found anybody that he necessarily trusts. Um, and part two is um, that he, yeah, I mean, he hasn't found anybody that necessarily trusts. And part two is that he's never built the business around um, what he should be doing from um, from a systems point of view. So, so call it 60-40 SME law. And what this really is, is if if my team and the systems and processes that are put in place can execute at 60% of what I can, um, so let's say I can execute at 80% or 90% and they can execute 60%, then it's a win for me because what I have is I'm leveraging other people's time, effort, knowledge, um, and, and efforts to, to benefit the business. So if I've got a team of 10 people and they're all operating at 60%, let's take it as a collective at 600% that they're operating at and I'm, I can only operate at 80%. I'm limited by time and effort and energy. So I, if, if, if my team are at 60%, you know, I'm happy from that point of view. So it's about building systems and not building a job for yourself. Which, um, which we apply across all our businesses is the Kaizen theory. And Kaizen theory is a theory of continuous improvement, it's a Japanese business theory. And really what it is, is it's really um, um, compounding um, of a business. So you will sit and look at your business today and you say, how, what is the thing that I can improve tomorrow to make my business better? Now, you don't want to be making massive changes because then your business looks very, very unstable. But what you want to do, you want to make continuous small improvements. And those continuous small improvements link to uh, look at 1%, 1% a week. If you can make a 1% improvement in your business a week, by the end of the year, you've almost got an 80%, a business almost 80% better through the compounding of those 1% improvements. So within our business, we're always questioning, how do we, how do, we do this better? You know, and and our, the next point is always questioning. We're always questioning, how do we do this better? What is the thing that we can do better within our business? Make it, um, uh, you know, make it work faster, make it, cleaner, make losses smaller, limit our risks, make our revenue greater. Um, and not we're not looking to double revenue, we're just looking to add, you know, a little bit all the time. And as that adds, we it continues growing. So the Kaizen theory of continuous improvement is something that we go through and it's a really, really useful tool and, and to start a, a meeting with how do we get better? Yeah, because no uh, no business, no matter how how good your business is, is, is going or how well your business is going, uh, is it ever perfect? So so I think it's a really good so sort of principle to have within your business. And with that, I say always question, and uh, again, Nick Harolumbus from, um, that wrote how to start a side hustle. Um, he talks about curiosity and I think he's key. He has keynotes on curiosity and writing books on curiosity. It's just always questioning. I think it's vitally important that you're always questioning um, something, uh, you know, questioning uh, ideas and questioning because it creates innovation and gives you other things to think about. And then the most dangerous phase in business, and this is the, the, the phrase that I want you to, so phrase, not phase, phrase in business. The most dangerous phrase in business 
is um, something that, that's vitally important. And I said earlier, when you're talking about community and segments, this is the thing that you're looking out for. Um, and this is the question, the, the, the line. The minute you hear that's how it's always been done is exactly when you know that this business or well, there's an opportunity to come in and add some value to this, this subset. You know, this how it's always been done is the worst phrase that I can ever hear in a business because the fact that it was done like that 50 years ago doesn't mean it needs to be done like that right now. And there's always better ways to do it. And the minute they say that's how it's always been done, they've settled and they've almost um, become, um, yeah, I mean, they've settled that, that this is the only way to do something. And the very minute you hear that, you know that there's an opportunity for you to, to come in and just change things up a bit. There's an edge for you. So just keep in mind, the minute you hear that in your own business, just know that you're in trouble. Um, you know, and that, that there's, something, there's something around the corner that's going to really shake your business up. And then I want to encourage you to be focused, but keep your eyes open. Something that I've struggled, struggled with a lot is focusing. And I think um, serial entrepreneurs um, in general are known as um, uh, you know, sh have shiny object syndrome. You sort of see a shiny object and you sort of chase, chase, chase. But if I look at my overall business, I've always remained focused within the space of property and education and entrepreneurship. It's just that there's, there's, there's opportunities within that space. So don't go and try and do a plastics business and then offer service and then do cleaning and then go and open a bolt-on shop. And then, you know, that, that's going to get you really off, off kilter and you're never going to really get your teeth into something. But be focused, but keep your eyes open on opportunities because there's opportunities all around you. If you're sitting here and you don't have an idea or you don't have something that you know that you want to do, from a business point of view, it might be worth reconsidering this whole entrepreneurship thing um, because there are so many opportunities everywhere, even within established run-of-the-mill businesses. And what I'd like to encourage you, if you are going to start a business right now, is stick with the basics. Don't go into a space where you're going to look for massive technology or massive innovation. There's two reasons for that. It's untested, uncharted territory, and it's very, very expensive to get into. Unless you have that skill set and that knowledge, and uh, you know, uh, unless you um, are a scientist or an engineer or a technology person, don't get into that space. Go for the basics because the basics are now more important than ever for uh, particularly South Africans in our economy. And then just quickly some tips from my side. Um, I want to really encourage you to consider your health first. Um, your, your health is, is way more important and, um, I mean, for, for, for you than you realize. Uh, your, ability to focus, your ability to concentrate, your, your energy levels, your ability to execute is directly linked to how you look after yourself. So make sure that you're exercising, make sure that you're getting fresh air, make sure that you're eating well. Don't, uh, and, and, and I'm speaking from personal experience, um, uh, two and a half years ago, I was um, a quarter bigger than I am now, so 25% um, bigger than I am now, not looking off myself, not eating well. Um, and from, if it affected everything, um, ability to concentrate, ability to focus, um, energy levels were really low, and it just became a never ending excuse. Once you start looking after yourself uh, a lot more, your energy levels are up, your focus is much better, your concentration, your thought process, um, your outlook on life, your outlook on business, everything. Everything changes. So concentrating your health first is vitally important that you're healthy first and foremost. Entrepreneurship by, by its nature can be, can be extremely stressful and you need an outlet. And exercise is one of the best outlets for you to, to release that, that stress and tension. Stress is, is something that really can result in, in you being sick. So you need to take care of yourself as much as possible. So, so your health is vitally important first. And second is, uh, secondly, is then business. So, and I know a lot of you guys are going to say, well, my family, my family is first, my health. Your health is vitally important to both your business and to your family. So, so look after yourself first. And, and the old saying of um, charity starts at home. You can't help anybody if you're not helping yourself. So make sure you look after yourself first. The reason I say business second, it, it's a temporary thing, but it needs your focus and energy and, and your nurturing to build this business, to create the thing that you want out of it. You can't get into business just for the sake of making money. You need some out, some sort of goal or outlook. And the reason you focus on that business second is to really get achieve that goal you want. So if you want to have um, you know live in live in a bigger house, have holidays, um, 
send your kids to private school, uh, you know, bigger cars, better cars, whatever those material things are, or non-material things, you want to help people, you want to create a uh, charitable work, work, whatever, whatever those things are. Your business needs to be profitable and needs to be generating cash and money to be able to inject or for you to be able to achieve your goals, which are generally financially based um, or have some sort of underlying financial need uh, for you to be able to achieve them. So health first and then business second. And then Charlie, I hope this answers your question. Is how important is building relationships with people in your industry look, you're looking to embark on, network and developing? It is so important, it's unbelievable. Network is vitally important and it's a game changer for you. You need to be relevant, you need to be uh, connected, you need to know people within your business space and you need to keep that up no matter what. You, you can't go network one day and, and then just expect everything to happen. It needs to be a consistent and continuous process where you're building relationships more than ever. Um, and, and, you know, I think we get, get into this digital age where people are very comfortable um, engaging via screens. Um, but I find it very difficult personally now to engage um, even, even properly on a telephone call. I'd much rather have a screen share where I can see somebody and engage with them there. Networking is, has never been easier. People are, have never been more comfortable than engaging remotely like they are now because of the pandemic. And it's something that you really need to make use of to network as much as possible. So you need to develop networking. You, need, you, need, you have to. You have to develop a network and develop relationships. How do you do that? Reach out to people. You know, um, LinkedIn is a fantastic tool for you to reach out to people. And in fact, one of our attorneys a couple of weeks ago was telling me that he had always admired a high-powered U.S. attorney. And he reached out to him via um, LinkedIn and the guy connected and they had a phone call um, just to have a chat about law and, and outlook on law and everything else. So people are way more open to connecting than ever. LinkedIn is a super useful tool and super powerful tool for you to be doing that. So networking, Charlie, is vitally important. And it's a game changer for me. I just want to add there, um, the creation of Epic was off the back of my experience from, from, um, from that was, uh, uh, you know, we created Epic because I experienced such a, uh, such a change in my business um, in terms of networking. I mean, I, I generally didn't like people, didn't like meeting new people. Um, I sort of stayed within my, my own little cluster and, and everything else. Um, but once I started opening up and started having conversations with people, it was really a game changer. So it's really, really important. Um, so what advice would you give to how to approach someone remotely? Um, honesty and transparently. Um, I think uh, there's a lot to be said for honesty uh, these days, you know, um, and I, I, those of you who maybe saw the epic conversation with Nick Harrow numbers a few weeks ago, um, I saw him in an interview. Um, he's one of those guys, he's a professional speaker, and I used to do just watch this interview. I think the thought was brilliant. We'd love to have a chat with you running the conversation. Uh, this is what I'm trying to achieve out of it. Uh, there's no fee for it. It's just, you know, it's just, it's adding value to people's lives. Would you be keen on doing it? And literally, not even a day later, he replied saying, hey, that sounds awesome. And let's do it. So I think, um, you know, um, be humble, be honest, be transparent. Um, don't try and, um, you know, hide anything or, or conceal anything. Be quite, quite um, forthcoming with the person, be honest. And, um, you know, a lot of people will certainly connect. And the person who comes back to you and doesn't want to connect is probably not the person you want to be connecting with anyway. Um, so, so just keep that in mind. Um, Ken is asking, would you put a minimum time limit from setup to execution? <sighs> Look, if, if you haven't, um, it depends how long you, what, what product you have. So it's going to take you a couple of months to, to get your product in place or create or formulate your product, you know, in you know, that's consideration. But once you're in a, re in a state of readiness, you know, no more than a month, no more than four weeks, you know, if you've got the product at hand or it's about to be delivered or you have your service ready, I would literally say, you know, within four weeks, within one month, because if you don't execute within four weeks, do you really intend to execute? So um, it's, it's just, you know, it, there, there's this, um, the speed thing needs to come back into it. If you're going to execute, execute, otherwise leave it. Um, don't, waste your, don't waste your time and, and everybody else is around you. Um, it's very important. Never stop learning. Um, <clears throat> I'm super keen on, on, on learning as much as possible. Um, you know, I, I love uh, reading articles. I read uh, the news and I read um, BBC, CNN, and um, News 24 every single, every single day. It's probably the first thing I do in the morning. I really just love, uh, love reading. I'm going to read the news to understand what's happening with the world, but also like seeing the business articles and, and understanding where they are. But when I see an interesting um, business idea or, or interesting entrepreneur, regardless of what interest they're in, I'll sort of research them and take a look at what they, they're talking about, what they're doing. So, so I think never stop learning isn't like, you know, go back to university and study, but never, never 
um, stop being curious. If I'll go back to Nick's um, story about being curious. Never stop questioning things, never stop asking. It's really interesting um, how other industries can give you lessons and, and guiding lights in terms of your own industry. You know, there might be completely separate products or different ideas or different um, industries entirely or markets, but sometimes just something small, one little switch within one business can make a massive difference within your own business as well. So just um, you know, never stop learning, never stop engaging with other entrepreneurs, never, it doesn't matter what industry. So when we talk about networking earlier, Charlie, don't only network within your own industry, your own market, network across pool uh, with, other, with other entrepreneurs, with other business executives, with other people who are actually out there executing. And this is also important for me. You know, one of the things I saw yesterday was, uh, you know, when you're going to invest in property, don't listen to the guy who's only bought one property because he's not executing, he's literally bought one property. And the same thing with business. Don't listen to the guy who tried to start a business and failed or started one business or the worst, worst um, entrepreneurs to listen to are guys who are franchise owners because they're just business owners. You want, if you're going to, have to take tips from an entrepreneur, um, find an entrepreneur. Find somebody who's creating, creating something, is adding value to people, um, is creating businesses. If you want to learn from a, uh, an entrepreneur who's creating a business and, a, and, and system and process and creating an asset of value, you're not going to go to the guy who is executing. Um, and, and I'm going to unfortunately use, for example, chartered accountants who go and open their own practices. They aren't, they aren't entrepreneurs. They're business owners. They've created a job for themselves. But the business owner is the person who the chartered accountant who's gone in, has got a whole lot of other chartered accountants under him, and he is running a system or process. And, and that system and process is the one that's creating the value, not himself. So uh, Charlie's saying you're absolutely engaged with a diverse market through networking gives an advantage to connect people and add value to each. Absolutely. And, and I'm a big one for, I've got a talk um, which I got from my team, and Megan on here, um, which says um, super connector. And super, being a super connector is, is actually where you want to play. You want to, be, you want to connect people all the time because by adding value to two people, by connecting them, you inherently will receive value at some point in the future. And it's really got, um, there's that whole marshmallow test with kids where they uh, put the two marshmallows on, or, or sorry, put one marshmallow and leave the room and if they don't eat, they get a second marshmallow and that delayed gratification. As an entrepreneur that's adding value to people's lives, you've got to accept that there's going to be delayed gratification. There's no short-term wins. There's, short, there's, no, there's no short-term win within an entrepreneurship. It's a process of building and growing and the creation of something. You're not going to win in three or six months' time, unfortunately, for the millennials out there. Um, so could I remember... Uh, recommend some interesting podcasts for entrepreneurs and businesses. Uh, look, Minus Bruderick's um, conversations uh, with local entrepreneurs was super interesting. Um, I don't know what he's called, but if you just look for Minus's um, podcasts, they're really good. Nick's also got some really good ones, chat some really interesting people, um, has some really interesting insights as well, as much as possible. And then um, Ray's Corp, um, Alan Ray's, he's also got some really good podcasts out there which are worthwhile um, listening to, again, all from a South African perspective. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Gary V. Um, I think he, he is quite um, black and white, it's quite hard, but it's also really, some really good learnings from there. Not always great, but um, not, not some big learnings. Um, biggest challenge is, uh, yeah. You have to trust the process. Absolutely agree with you, Charlie. You know, trusting the process, trusting what you've created, trusting that you're adding value to people's lives, um, but also not, not being scared of, of, of um, you know, cutting the losses also. So if you realize you're going down the route and, and you know, yeah, it's, it's you, you, you um, what's it called? Beating a dead horse. You know, walk away. There's no such thing as failure. You know, the failure will come if, you, if, you, if you're dead at the end of the day. And, and that's the thing, you know, if you, if you leave yourself dead in the water, we've got no prospect of recreating yourself or pivoting is the great word at the moment. You've got no prospect of pivoting uh, because you've got dug your holes so deep, that's where you're going to be fail. So if you identify that early on, don't be scared to walk away and pivot. So never stop learning is also vitally important. But I think this one is, is so, so important for successful entrepreneurs and um, so many successful entrepreneurs stop listening. And once they stop listening, they become tone deaf to the market and then suddenly they get um, sideswiped um, by new products, new ideas or new entrants. So never, ever stop listening to employees, never stop listening to your customers, never stop listening to the market. And that's just go back to um, what I said earlier about stay focused, but keep your eyes open. Um, you know, we're in, we're in the property market, which is yet to be massively disrupted by technology, but we as a team keep our eyes wide open for opportunities or ideas or things that are happening around us to make sure that we don't get sideswiped by anything. So never, ever, ever stop listening to the market, your consumers, and most importantly, never stop listening to your, your employees 
they are at the forefront, unless you're at the forefront, but they're generally at the forefront, engaging with the customers and are able to give you effective feedback. I mentioned that I've got a mentor and I certainly recommend that you find a mentor and that can be paid for or not, it doesn't matter. The point is that somebody that you respect, somebody that has achieved something along the lines of what you'd like to achieve and is able and willing to give you good sound advice without, um, you know, without being degrading or, or skeptical or anything else that gives, gives good, solid um, and emotional business advice. So find a mentor, somebody that you respect um, is vitally important because sometimes that mentor is going to have to give you hard story. It's going to have to tell you going down the wrong route and you've got to respect them enough to take it on board, um, you know, digest it and make a decision whether you're going to take it on board and change or take it on board and, and accept that it may or may not have be, be the right thing. So it's vitally important that you do find a mentor, that you do engage with people, that you can, um, that you can, you can uh, um, uh, rely on to give you some, some thoughts. And that mentor can actually be a business partner, a, a peer. It doesn't have to be this, this person that's, um, that's uh, you know, 15 years ahead of you. I think often we look at these, these mentors and they, they, they're so big and they've done so many things and just like, oh, you know, I'm asking such a silly question. Should I ask that question? It could even be somebody who's a peer. You could have multiple mentors, mentors for different things, different areas of your business, different areas of your life, um, you know, different sounding boards. So it's important that you've got those sounding boards and those mentors that can, that can um, pull you along as well. And I mean, holding you accountable. Um, it's more of a coach than a, than, a, than a mentor, but certainly hold you accountable to your commitment and your short-term goals. So Charlie says they've um, got some sounding boards that are, are the same age. So, and, and it's important, you know, um, you know, I've got, I've got sounding boards that are, are, are younger than I am, have got less experience, but you know, I know that they way more um, innovative sometimes. So it's just uh, you know, people who are sounding boards and, and you can have multiple sounding boards for the same thing as well. And if I can't recommend read, read, read enough. Now I'm, I'm, I love reading, uh, I carry um, books with me all the time. Obviously um, the books I carry with are no longer um, uh, a physical paperback book, but um, it's uh, all in our books. So I've got a uh, nice our book, um, the app on on apple and there's just books everywhere that are that i love reading um and and the, i was reminded i haven't been reading more recently but but i was reminded of this by watching a bill gates um uh documentary recently and he actually carries about six or seven books in a bag with him wherever he goes wherever he flies and every shot once they tell you about it every shot you see of him in this documentary, he's got all these books with him and he is constantly reading. And I think it's so important that you keep, again, that you keep on filling your mind, you keep yourself active and you keep yourself going and you keep looking for the edge. And it, when I talk about the edge, you're always looking for the, the next thing. And it's not, not the thing that's gonna, uh, you know, that's gonna catapult you to the, to the new age. It's just the edge that's gonna make your business a little bit better, a little bit better, back into the cars in theory, just a little bit better all the time. And my last point for today is um, something, and it's um, already uh, looks like an hour's flown by. So, um, is um, is this is uh, superheroes always need sidekicks? And um, you know, when I talk about superheroes need sidekicks, I want to talk about your product. So, if you've gone down the road of identifying you've got this product and it's the most amazing product ever, um, keep in mind that you're, you're always going to need sidekicks from uh, from a multiple streams of income point of view. Um, People always say that opening a business, being an entrepreneur is so risky and, and something that you really need to, to um, you know, be careful of doing it. Oh, don't do it. You're, where are you going to get your income from? The reality is the only risk that you have when you're um, building a business or when you're employed is that you only have one, uh, one income. The moment you have a single income, you reliant on, on that single stream income to sustain you, to, to pay for your, your fee, your costs and expenses, um, pay for your salary, uh, pay for your employees. So I really encourage you guys to have two types of sidekicks. First one is multiple streams of income. So look at cross-sell and upsell um, from your hero, your hero being your product or your service. So look at a cross-sell or upsell, what can be the add-ons, what could be complementary um, incomes to that. And part two is make sure you're building reserves um, on the side. Now, those of you that, I mean, uh, have had a business now going through lockdown, a lot of businesses have closed down. And um, a saying that I love, uh, that I heard at the beginning of lockdown from somebody and, and I'm going to continue using, is that when the tide goes out, you'll see, you'll see who's um, being swimming naked. And it's amazing how many businesses who you thought are these huge, massive businesses that have actually gone under 
simply because of 10 weeks of lockdown. 10 weeks of lockdown should not shut down any business, regardless of how stringent those lockdowns are, if you've built your business correctly. Um, yes, there are certain businesses that are going to really struggle, and yes, income is going to drop. But if you put away the right level of reserves, if you've got the multiple streams of income, the minute one drops, another one should come back up again for you. It should sort of uh, leave itself for you that you can continue running your business. So every superhero needs a sidekick, and I encourage you, to, when you're building your business, to always keep the sidekicks in mind as much as possible. Because I tell you what, during um, a lockdown scenario, which may or may not happen again um, anytime soon, those sidekicks quickly become the superheroes. Um, got a question here from Mushudu saying, any books that you can recommend when starting up? Um, Rework is one of my favorite ones. Um, Rework just sort of looks at um, concepts that are out there. Um, and I'll tell you who wrote Rework. Uh, um, concepts that are out there that, um, that, that just give a, bit, a little bit more thought to it and sort of come at a different angle. Um, for example, the idea of a business plan being um, just a guess is actually directly from um, Rework. Let me just find uh, Rework for you. Um, uh, Growing Greatness, uh, Pepe Marie is a really good story um, to read as well as well as um, who moved my cheese again really really good book um to read there's uh, to be honest there's, there's actually so many um cross sell upsell should these be congruent so um so yeah so i mean cross on upsell so so you know the multiple streams of income can be different so they could could align with your business entirely or they could be with a complementary uh, provider um so for example you could could put in place if you've got an education business, you could put in an affiliate model where you are an affiliate with somebody else who provides alternative content and you can point some of your community towards them as an example. So uh, if I'm doing property investment training and somebody else is doing um, e-commerce, building e-commerce business training, we know that we both deal with entrepreneurs with different commodities and different outlooks, but I might find within my community that I've got somebody that wants to get into e-commerce and therefore I build an affiliate model with somebody outside of our space. Um, oh, uh, the E-Myth um, e -E on the book side again, sorry. The E-Myth Revisited is, is, is a great book um, to read in understanding um, how to build a system in a business and a, and a business of value versus a um, creating yourself a job. So uh, he has Rework. Rework is by John, John Fraud. Um, so Rework is a great book. Um, yeah, so, so cross sell upsell. And just be careful to get into a space where you, we, the, the cross selling and upselling actually becomes unethical. Um, so you don't want to be in a space where uh, your sales teams, for example, are upselling people into products that they don't necessarily need. Um, uh, actually, funny enough, I watched a documentary on Wells Fargo last night. And Wells Fargo's uh, entire business model was based on cross sell upsell um, from uh, in the early, I think the early 2000s. And um, they were, they, they at one stage were valued as the most valuable bank on the planet. Um, and which is mainly because they, they cross sell upsell culture. Um, but what they did was that cross sell upsell culture became actually quite an unethical and uh, problematic issue for them to the degree where their CEO was fired or, or forcibly resigned. And the second CEO who used to be the CFO took over and was called in front of Congress in the US and then shortly after that resigned. So, so it's, um, yeah, cross-sell and upsell are opportunities for you to create more value to your business, but just be careful that you don't get into space where it becomes a bit of an, or could potentially become an ethical thing by pushing product down people's um, throats that they don't necessarily need. Cool, so that's the end of, um, end of my sort of little, little spiel for you guys. Um, Karabo, I've got a question slide here. So if there are any questions, we had quite a few questions during the session. So um, yeah, if there is anything, it's, um, spit them out. Otherwise, yeah, I'm done. Exceptional, Grant. Absolutely um, exceptional. I don't know how everyone found it, um, found the session. You know, it's so much in topic. Stop thinking. I start executing, talk about exact. And I know some of you are asking, um, okay, so how do I get to, you know, where can I go? How do I get this one page uh, business plan? I've already gotten other people just messaging me directly saying, I need help someone to work me through this business plan. So I have to, and I, and I thought, let me just wait and go through the exercise so you can get a taste of grant. I have to announce to you guys, I am very excited 
Um, Epic is launching a um, idea to your first customer 10 week bootcamp. Now there were questions there grants around how long should this take? Um, you know, from cradle to grave, coming up with idea, getting your first customer in 10 weeks. And what is what I'm excited about this bootcamp, two things that I'm excited about. One, you're gonna get a real taste of grants, not just in this con concept. The whole bootcamp is designed in forums, work group, using some of the templates he's introduced you to and actually practically helping you do it so that you actually get that idea out of your head onto a one-page business plan, uh, piloted proof of concept and, um, and then out in the market. Now we're, what, so that's the first exciting thing. The second ex thing I'm beyond excited about is that there will be an exclusive epic woman launch okay we have an epic man grant right <laughs> and what we are doing for this epic woman launch is we completely discounting it just for epic woman um we'll have to talk about this epic man um you guys get to go we are very conscious of empowering women we're conscious we're in COVID times so we're really gonna specifically set this thing apart for us, Epic Woman, um, and then before the rest of the world uh, gets a hold of it and that pricing looks very different. So please uh, watch out uh, for it. Get to the Epic Woman Facebook group. This is why I want you to like that group because um, uh, myself, Grant, and the team are gonna have an opportunity to not just share how you can start executing but to hold your hand in executing. I don't know if there's anyone here that would really benefit from that. And if, if you are like, I need this, I've been thinking too much <laughs> and, I, and everything Grant has said is what I need to do. Um, but if you need your help, your hand help, just do a shout out on the chat and we'll make sure that we get to you. And more importantly, with Grant, we'll get to really just support you, which is really good. Uh, Grant, you've proved that you are truly an epic woman. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be, I'll try my best. I'll do a, I'm going to do, I'll do a need to show my high heels or not. I'm not sure. <laughs> I be, no, we will believe you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> absolutely. So. Um, on behalf of us, Grant, um, thank you so much for giving us a real practical session on how to get it done. A lot of people have been saying, I am stuck. How do I take my first step? Um, and you really just shared tools that we're going to make completely available for everybody. I really appreciate the time um, so much and, 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 and really showing how simple it is and how to stop overthinking. Um, on behalf of Epic Woman, we are so grateful. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Crow. Thanks, everyone. Um, everybody, uh, thank you so much again for connecting with us. You know we're having it next week. Um, again, we'll be featuring another entrepreneur, just showing you example after example of people that are actually doing this. Uh, don't forget, you find us on the Facebook page. Like, we'll be sharing quite a number of details there. There's some of you that are wanting to get hold of us. Go on the Epic Woman uh, Facebook page. Um, uh, just anywhere there, shout out and say, I need you, contact me. Um, we will be very, very much available. Grant, what's the Epic uh, email address for those of us that want to, I see some people wanting an email yeah. address. I'll put in there, it's um, team at Epic South Africa, uh, Epic, SouthAfrica.com. There we go. So you can email us directly on that uh, epic uh, uh, page. Make sure you like on Facebook and more importantly, watch out for the exclusive Epic Woman 10 week bootcamp. Idea to your first customer, paid customer. Grant was very clear. <laughs> not your mother, no, not no. your brother, not your cousin, a paid customer. I'm um, Khaizi, an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure, Busi. Um, Absolute pleasure, Kwebi. From us, everyone, have a brilliant, brilliant evening, a level three evening. Thank you so much. And thank you to you, Grant. Here's Good night, that. everyone. Thanks.